continue the solutions notes, we talked about how to make a solution. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to make a dilution. And they're slightly different. So if you wanted to make a solution like a Kool-Aid or like a country time lemonade solution, then what you would do is you tell me, actually, let me grab the powder here, and then you tell me what you would do. You would take a certain amount of powder and do what to it? Yeah, you would add water to it. So you put this into there, then you add water to it, and then what do you do? Stir. stir. Perfect. Then you just stir it. Okay? So that's your solution. How do you make a dilution? Add more water. Awesome. To make a dilution, what you need to do is you need to pour some of it into a cup or into a different container, and then you add water to it, and now you've diluted it. Okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what if you need a certain concentration, a certain dilution, a dilution made to a certain concentration. How can you calculate that out to figure out how much are you taking out of the original stuff and how much water are you adding to it, okay? So that's the entire idea of solutions and dilutions of making these. So we know that when we're making solutions, we used one equation, and it's this molarity equation. And molarity, everybody say molarity, moliters. Molarity, moliters. It's like the mole money thing, but it's moliters. Okay, one more time. Molarity, moliters. Molarity, moliters. So molarity is moles over liters. Moles of what? Of the solute. And remember, the solute is what goes in, what gets dissolved into the solvent. And the liters, that's your total volume overall, okay? If I take and I put, um, and I, I've made my lemonade, and I pour a whole bunch of different cups of the lemonade. Have I changed my concentration? If I have one that only has, I don't know, half the cup filled, another one has a full cup filled, and another one someone's drinking out of like some thermos, okay? Are those all at the same concentration? Yes or no? Yes, perfect. How can you change the concentration of it? Add more water, or if you add water, what are you doing to the concentration? Are you decreasing it, or are you increasing the concentration? Decreasing. decreasing, good. But you're increasing the volume of it, but you've decreased the actual concentration. It's not as strong as it was before. How could you increase the concentration? Add more of the powder, or... Which is the solute, perfect. Or what else could you do? What if you had no more powder? How could you add less water? Perfect. Boil some of the water off. Get the water to evaporate. And if you can get the water to evaporate off or you boil it, then you can get it back. Um, you can get a more concentrated solution. Okay? So that's how you make a solution. And so what we're going to do, and we talked about how to use this equation. Sometimes, like in this problem here, we are solving for the volume. So we did a swap thing. In this one here, we were solving for the molarity, so we just did the moles over the liters. In this one, we were looking for the grams. So we first found the moles. Once we found the moles, we converted into grams using an L chart. So you can use this equation and solve for any one of these three things. When you know two of them, you can figure out the other one. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how do you make a dilution. So the first thing is, it says it's going to ask you to change the molarity. Or maybe it'll say, um, what volume do you need if you want to make a certain concentration, then what's the volume? What is this equation looking like to you that we did, that we've done before? P1V1. It looks like P1V1 equals P2V2, yes? Yeah. And we call that a, a proportion or a ratio. So we either call this a ratio or a proportion. And remember, the idea is that once you know one set, you can figure out, you can make a change, and you can figure out the other one just by using this proportion or this ratio between them. So all we're going to do in order to figure this out is we're going to put in our molarity and our volume, and then they'll either give us a new molarity or a new volume, and we have to solve for one or the other, okay? So I'm going to tell you that... Um, I know that when I was at State and they said um, one of the first labs that I had done, and I remember, I don't even remember if it was the first, but it's like one that I really remember because I ended up being under a lot of stress. We go to the back and um, everyone gets their own key and then you unlock, you pull out all of the equipment that you need. And the lab that we had written out, we had, we had to bring our procedure in and it said that we needed 
um, a 0.5 molar solution of whatever it was. I don't remember what the chemical was. So I go over to the table and the table, the counter said something like a six molar solution of it. And I was like, um, I need a 0.5 molar and this says six molar. And so the people have no time. You get three hours in lab, but as soon as you're done, you leave. So most people want to just get in and get out. There wasn't really a lot of socializing. It was like, we're just going to do what we need to do. And you're not working in groups. You're working alone. So I'm looking around, and I had never done anything like a dilution problem. And so I asked someone, I was like, hey, what, what, what are you doing? How, uh, why does it say 6 molar, but we need 0.5 molar? And the person was like, so set up a ratio. I was like, what, a ratio? What, what are you talking about? And I was confused. So this is something that I wanted to make sure that we did so that you get the idea of these ratios and these proportions so that if you're in a situation like that, you know what to do. So remember, all you, before you start this, you want to make sure that you label everything, okay? So the first thing says, how many milliliters? What are we looking for if we're looking for milliliters? A volume. Now, it doesn't matter if you call this V1 or V2. As long as, if I call this V1, then this has to be my molarity one, okay? They have to go together. So we want to know how many of this stuff has to be added to make this. So we haven't made the 500 milliliters yet. So if that's the stuff that we're making, then we should call that two. We should call this one one. Perfect. So this I'm going to call V1, which makes this what? M1. Perfect. So this is my M1. That's my V1. Uh, added to appropriate amounts of water to make 500 mils. That would be V2. Perfect. Of a 0.5 molar HCl. So that means that's my M2. Okay. And all we're going to do is fill these numbers in. So we're going to use M1V1 equals M2V2, and let's fill it in. So what's our M1? 2.00. That's the one, yep, that's the one we know. So 2.00M. V1. That's what we're looking for. Very good. M2. 0 0.500 molar. Very good. And V2. 500 milliliters. Now, people said, do we need to switch this into liters? As long as you're doing a proportion like this, a ratio like this, if that's milliliters, then this is going to be milliliters, okay? So it doesn't matter if you leave it in milliliters or liters, as long as you understand that your units will be the same for both volumes. Okay, this is our fourth unit that we're doing a little bit of this multiplying and dividing and how do you do this without rearranging anything. If that's your x, you start opposite your x and do what? Multiply. Perfect. So go ahead and multiply these. And then what do you do to this 2 then? Divide. divide. Awesome. So tell me what you get when you multiply and divide this out. Okay, so our v1 is equal to 125 what? Milliliters. All right. v1 goes with m1. So whatever this m is, that's what we're using. Now, we're not done yet because, yeah, fine, you can do this on paper, but can you actually do this in lab? Because that's only half of it, all right? Because a bunch of people can do the calculation, and then they get into lab, and they're like, what am I supposed to do with this now? 125 mils, okay? Um, so I want you to consider, similar to, we have a very concentrated country time lemonade solution, and I want to dilute it. And in this case, we're going from a 2 molar to a 0.5 molar. And you don't want to waste, okay? You don't want to waste a bunch of it. So you do this calculation, and you figure out that it's 125 mils of this 2 molar. Guess what you do to it? You're going to pour 125 mils into a container, and what are you going to do to it? Nice. Say it louder. Add water. Perfect. Add water until what? Until you have how much? Nice. Awesome. Add water until you have 500. That's how this works. Okay? Because if you just pour the 125 in, did you decrease the concentration of it? No. no you didn't change the concentration. You can pour a whole bunch of them like we did on Friday, and you're not changing the concentration of it. You don't change the concentration of it until you add water to it. Or, again, like we said, you can evaporate the water or you add more of the solute to it. But you're not actually changing the concentration of it unless you add water to it. So, our statement is really important. So we're going to make a statement on how we're going to make this. Okay? 
We're going to pour 125 mils. Pour 125 mils of what? What do we have originally? Hydrochloric Yeah, but which one? Because there, there are two of them. There's a 0.5 and there's a 2. What do we have to start? The 2. Awesome. Of the 2 molar HCl, very good, into, now we're not going to use just any random container. We're going to use what is called a volumetric flask. Nice into a volumetric flask, period. You're going to pour that into a flask, and then, just like we had heard, you're going to add water until the total volume is how much? 500, which is what we want our final amount to be, is 500 mils, okay? And that's how you make a dilution. So the important piece is there, it's a two-part problem. So not only do you want to make sure that you know how to calculate it, once you get your calculation down, then how you make it. Okay, let's try this next one. And this is it. Then we're done with these. I need 50 mils of a 0.1 molar copper hydroxide solution, and we're starting with a 0.3. This, typically what you start with, you call your stock. So if you ever see that, um, and they'll say, your stock solution is 6 molar, your stock solution is 12 molar, or whatever. That's what you're keeping stock of. And then what you're going to do is you're going to dilute the one that's the stock. Okay? All right, so what are we labeling this as, this 15 milliliters? This is how much you need. So that would actually be your V2. Good. It doesn't matter, though. As long as if you call this V1 and you call this M1, you're going to calculate it correctly. Okay? So then this, I, if I call this V2, then this should be M2. M2. Awesome. That's my M2. So then that makes this one, my original stock solution is my, it's a molarity though, right? So M1. Very good. M1. And then what am I looking for? Yep. I'm looking for v, V1, which is the only thing that I don't have. So again, let's write M1 V1 equals M2 V2, and let's fill everything in. So my original molarity of the stock is? 0.3 molar. My V1 is what I'm looking for. That's the one that they don't tell me. Equals my final uh, molarity, 0.1. And my final volume, 15 milliliters. Good. Again, if these were switched, you would get the same answer, okay? As long as you keep the correct ones together. So it could be that this is on this side and you're solving for V2, your calculation is going to be the same because you always start where from your X when you do your calculation? Opposite. And what do you do to these? Multiply and divide. Awesome. Go ahead and plug those into your calculator and tell me what you get for V1. Five. Okay, and three sig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs, so let's do 5.00 milliliters. Because that's in milliliters, then this one's in milliliters. Again, we're not done yet because now we need to make our statement. Pour what? Five milliliters of what? Which one do you have right now? Point three is what we have in stock. Good. So that's what we have today is the point three molar. CuOH2 into where? Not into a cup, not into a beaker, into a volumetric, volumetric flask. Into a volumetric flask, period. That's the first step of that. Then you're going to add water, water. awesome. Add water until volume. total volume is, what do we want our total volume to be? 15 mils until the total volume is 15 mils. Now, um, this is the proper way of doing it. People will say, Can you just, can't you just say add 10 milliliters of water? Because if you added five mils of this, then 10 mils of water will make that 15. That is true, but the way that um, dilution statements are made in chemistry, they say, just to make sure that you have that amount of a solution, They'll say, put it in, then add the water until you get to the total, okay? That's typically what they do. All right, this last part just talks a little bit about, um, about what are called colligative properties. We're not doing colligative properties except for the fact that I want to make sure that we make ice cream, okay? And that's kind of where it falls. So we're just going to read this paragraph together right here, and we'll talk a little bit just very briefly about um, these colligative properties. 
So physical properties can be divided into two categories. They're, they're what are called extensive properties and intensive properties. Extensive sounds like what? External. External, things on the outside, perfect, okay? And these, like mass and volume, these actually just depend on how much of the sample that you have, on the amount of the sample. They depend on the amount of the sample that you have. Where intensive properties do not depend on what? The amount, okay? So if it's something that it doesn't matter how much you have of it, it doesn't change whether or not you have 10 grams or you have 30 grams of it, then that's called an intensive property. Extensive is one that does matter. If you have five grams or if you have 100 grams, it makes a difference, all right? So these do not depend on the amount of the sample as intensive properties. So there's a subset of intensive properties that are called colligative properties, and these can only be applied to solutions. And since we're talking about solutions, like lemonade solutions, like if you're making ice cream, like if you have um, things like antifreeze in your car and things like that, that's where these will make a difference. By definition, one of the properties of a solution is a colligative property if it depends only on the ratio of the number of particles of solute and solvent in your solution. The identity of it doesn't matter. In other words, comparing something like NaCl salt, used as rock salt, to something like magnesium chloride, which also is used as rock salt. And you can use either one of these in ice cream making, okay? You can use salt as, as the rock salt, NaCl, or you can use the magnesium chloride as the rock salt, okay? One of them works better, and one of them is actually more expensive, okay? Take a guess which one. The MgCl2, okay? The NaCl, and, you're, and here's why. It's based on the colligative properties. Na and Cl have a certain amount of ions in them. How many, I, how many sodium ions do we have here? One, and how many chloride ions? One. one. That equals two total ions. MgCl2, how many Mg plus twos do we have? One, and how many Cl minuses do we have? Two. two. That's a total of three. Because it has three, it actually lowers the freezing point more than something that only has two particles in it, okay? It doesn't matter if it's sodium or magnesium or calcium. That doesn't matter. It's not the identity of it that matters as much as it is how many ions or your number of particles that you have. We're not doing any calculations with this, okay? So it says we're not performing any calculations, but in EP, for example, they use an I to tell how many ions are in the solution. And so if you have something that has more ions in the solution, then um, that actually is better for freezing point or boiling point elevation. Think about Kool-Aid. So we're gonna make a weak Kool-Aid solution by dissolving one grain of Kool-Aid in a glass of water. So you have two glasses here, and you've got water, and you have one little particle inside of there, okay? And then you have a second container, and in the second container, you have a whole bunch that you've added in, okay? So which one's more concentrated, A or B? Which one's more concentrated? B, B. okay. So it says the properties are different between the two, um, between the two glasses, um, the, these, these pop properties, of what we call them, are the colligative properties. So it says what we're gonna find is we're gonna find that the stronger one is going to be darker, it's going to be sweeter, it'll probably be more dense, okay? And the color of it will be, it'll be a prettier pink or yellow or green or whatever color that, um, you're, whatever it is, if it's lemonade or Kool-Aid that you're using. So this is the basis of what we call spectrophotometry, and what you can do is you can pass light through, and you use a machine that passes light through the sample. The more light that comes out on the other side, um, the less concentrated it was. Why? What is the substance doing to the light as the light passes through it? Absorbing it. Nice. It actually will absorb the light as it passes through your sample. So if you put light through this one, what would you expect coming out of this is, as opposed to passing light through this one? Which one will you get less light coming through, A or B? B, B. okay? So you're going to get more light coming through this one, less light coming through this one, 
And so that's how a spectrophotometer works. Um, and we have machines, we have like big machines, they have smaller ones too that work in the same way. So things like color, taste, texture, and density are all things that would be colligative properties. Strong Kool-Aid boils at a higher temperature than weak Kool-Aid. Boiling point is a colligative property. Why? Why is it that this one here boils at a higher temperature than something like this? Well, you know that in order to get something to boil, the molecules need to do what? What do the molecules need to do in order to get them to boil? What are the molecules trying to do like we all want? Freedom, right? We all want to spread apart and escape, right? So what happens here in this situation is the molecules get trapped. So they're trying to escape, but then you have this particle, they call them non-volatile solutes that don't evaporate. And so they keep bumping into these particles and they're trying to escape and they can't. And so that's um, why it actually raises the boiling point when you put salt in water. So people have asked that before and said, why is it that if I put salt in water to boil my pasta, why is it boiling at a higher point, at a higher temperature? And so it raises the boiling point. Or it actually will depress your freezing point and make your freezing point even lower. So it says um, strong Kool-Aid will freeze at a lower temperature than weak Kool-Aid. Same idea. Somebody want to try to guess at, as to why? So now these molecules are trying to come together. The water molecules are trying to freeze. What's happening? They're getting in the way. Awesome. Sure, sure. Perfect. They're getting in the way. Okay. They're trying to come together and freeze, but then there's this particle in there in between them that's getting in the way, and they're having a harder time coming together to freeze. Okay. So by adding salt or a solute to any um, solvent, you always end up increasing the boiling point and decreasing the freezing point. And so I do this thing where we do like boiling point elevation, freezing point depression. And so like back and forth between the two. Okay? And, um, and that's it. Then this just talks. We're done with this, so we're not going to go um, into the colligative properties. All right.